Well, greetings and salutations, everyone, and welcome to tonight's second half. Before we jump into this very, very interesting interview, a couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nedolmy. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support the channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It does not cost a cent. Click the like button. It takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon and folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because all these things really do help the channel to continue to grow and go. And folks, they really do matter. Now everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump into tonight's second half, shall we? All right, everybody. Today I have a very special guest uh, a guest who I'm sure all of you are familiar with. I have Lon Strickler on with us. He is a Florentine researcher, author, and publisher of The Phantom and Monsters. Lon, how are you today? I'm doing fine. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you coming on. Um, I've got a list of questions that I've been dying to ask you, and I know that a lot of people are tuned right into the Phantom and Monsters webpage. Um, so right now, pretty much the first question I'd like to ask you is um, when and kind of what got you into the field of cryptozoology? Well, I have been an intuitive ever since I was very young. So uh, I've been involved with paranormal. But I never really uh, did any investigations as far as uh, cryptids or anything to that nature. It was all either uh, hauntings or a possible UFO sighting once in a while. But I was quite young, you know. I I graduated from high school in the mid-70s. So um, when I was living in Sykesville, Maryland, and I was, I used to go fishing, fly fishing on the uh, South Branch Tachigo River. I had a Bigfoot encounter, uh, what people referred to as the Sykesville monster. But anyway, that, uh, I had that and I got interested in what I had encountered. I did some investigations on, uh, prior sightings of this, this creature. And uh, that's kind of where it began at. And I uh, had a, a winged humanoid encounter in 1988 here in Pennsylvania. And, uh, you know, it, it just kind of it just kind of expanded after that. Okay, that's awesome. That's awesome. I, I, I knew that you had an encounter with the Sykesville monster. I did not know that you had an encounter with a winged cryptid. Um, it seems like there... Uh, the sightings for those creatures or whatever they're, they are are getting very um, abundant as of late. I mean, we had <clears throat> Chicago just last year. It seemed like, you know, one day after a next, there would be another encounter, um, which is very creepy, And if you ask me. Uh, any... Any idea on what possibly that may be? Not really. Uh, you know, the first sightings that were documented were in 2011. Uh, there were three sightings in South Chicago. And an associate of mine and I were both aware of that. They, they came through MUFON. Uh, but early in 2017, there were a few other sightings that were reported in MUFON. And uh, Manuel Navarrete and I started looking into it. Uh, fortunately, we were able to get find one of the witnesses in Manuel interviewed her since she lived in Chicago. 
So we kind of let it be known that we were interested in getting reports that we wanted to find out what this was. We were you know, deeply investigating and researching this topic. And it just snowballed from there. And um, since then, I've had other local investigators come on board, particularly uh, Tobias Whale and his wife, Emily. And uh, we have been working extensively since 2017 on these sightings. And in fact, at this point, we're up over well over 100 sightings that we believe are... Uh, are actually real. I mean, are that we can we believe are, uh, you know, credible. And uh, but more recently, since October of last year, most of the sightings have been in and around the uh, O'Hare International Airport. And that and there's been some other things involved with it, possible UFO or alien activity. So uh, we really don't know what this is. We've got some theories. Uh, I believe it's some type of uh, interdimensional species of some type coming through either portal or able to cloak itself or whatever. But, uh, you know, at this point, we really just don't know what we're dealing with. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I've had, you know, I've read a ton and I've kind of theories. I kind of come up with maybe... Possibly uh, because I believe that back in the long history ago, uh, the people claimed that the Anaki or Anunnaki had wings. Um, so I have kind of had the theory that maybe these things are not of this earth at all. Maybe they're some sort of, you know, outer space alien uh, that came from a UFO and like you said they're by the O'Hare airport or airport so that's kind of what I you know my theory but you know like it's theories and everyone has them you know so it's and I think that's the best part about the whole field um now a lot of people know what crypto uh is and you know UFOs but what is foreign teen researcher mean well fortian the term fortian is derived from uh charles fort who was probably the earliest cryptozoologist or purveyor of the unexplained and uh he wrote several books on uh the topic of unexplained phenomena <clears throat> and as a result of that we uh we consider uh, him being the, the founder, and that's why we use the term fortune. It's just not all cryptozoology or other, it, it's, it's the whole nine yards. I mean, it's all unexplained supernatural phenomena. Right. Like ghosts, everything. Yeah. Everything. Um, now, I, uh, curious. The webpage, Phantom and Monsters, did you, I know you started the blog, I think, in 2005. Um, mm -hmm. Was that before, that was before all of the books that you started writing, correct, or no? Yeah, the books came later. I, I mm -hmm. wrote the first book in uh, 2013. It's been revised since then. But, uh, yeah, all my books have been written since 2013. Okay, okay. All right. Um, so I, the next question I had was, have you ever encountered anything, which was, yes, the Sykesville monster and the, uh, winged cryptid or winged humanoid. Now the Sykesville monster, how old were you roughly? Hmm. 81. So I've been, uh, I guess around 25, 24 maybe. Okay. All right. Um, can you touch bases on, on that for us a little bit, if you don't mind, or is that something that you... Yeah, briefly okay. what happened was I was fly fishing on the south branch of the Patapsco River, which is just one mile downstream from Sykesville, Maryland. And um, I was, you know, I was, I was been to this location a lot. Uh, I was fishing for uh, rock bass, and uh, 
I happen to uh, see a dog across the other bank on the north side. And he was just moving about, going in and out of the weeds. I didn't even pay him my mind until I heard a yelp sound. And when I heard the dog yelping, I looked across the way, and this large creature stood up in the weeds. And I could see it from maybe mid-chest up because the weeds were so high. But it was a hairy creature uh, that was bipedal. And I just really didn't know at the time what I was looking at. You know, I've heard of Bigfoot, but I, you know, I'm, the first thing you think about is, well, you don't know what you're, you know, you're kind of in shock. So this thing basically moved to my left and walked out of the weeds and onto the riverbank and kind of stood there looking at me. And we locked eyes for about five seconds or so. It was uh, about 30, 30 yards away from me. Uh, I mean, I couldn't do anything. I would just stand there with my waders on in the water and, you know, just looking at this thing, you know, hoping that it was just going to stay away from me. But it turned and briskly walked up into the uh, woods, up into the hill. So uh, I was quite shocked at what I just saw. And my first reaction was to go and report it. And well, that's what I did. I got in my car. And I uh, drove back into Sykesville, which was like a three-minute drive. And I made the report. Uh, stopped. There was a phone booth there at a bar by the river. We'll go back to the location. Somebody will meet you there. And when I got back after three or four minutes, there was already a Maryland State Police officer standing there with one of those uh, wooden barriers across the road. And he told me, you have to leave. I told him, I said, well, look, I, I made the report. They told me to come back. He said, you got to go. So that's what I did. I went back home. Mm. So after about an hour later, I came on back down there, and there were cars everywhere. And uh, I walked back up to the barrier, and by that time, there was a uh, Tower County police officer standing there. And I asked him what was going on, though I didn't tell him I went, was the one who made the report. He said, Somebody said they saw a Bigfoot. But, I mean, there were people everywhere. And, and like, seven or eight people with dogs were going all around, all over into the woods, into the weeds, up and down the river. There's a large white tent set up across the uh, the river where I'd seen this thing. And there were several uh, local authorities and federal authorities. They used to drive those black wagoneers back then. And there were two of those there. I heard a helicopter. Didn't see it, but I heard it. So uh, I decided to leave and went back home. I, when I got home, I called several of the, um, the, new, the news channels in Baltimore and told them what happened. They said, yeah, you know, uh, call us, we'll call you back and we want to do interviews. And um, maybe five days a week later, I hadn't heard a thing. And I called one of them back and he told me he just didn't want to talk to me. So... There was some type of cover-up involved with that. I don't know exactly what the deal was. I, I do know that there had been an earlier sighting of this thing like three hours prior to that in a in Marysville, Maryland, which is just down the river from where I was. But there was more involved with it. I mean, you know, the feds and all the police officers coming out, they just don't do that. And, you know, they didn't do that back then. Uh, I did talk to a police officer who had been there, and he verified everything that happened. And uh, but long story short, you know, this is where I got involved with cryptozoology. I was fascinated with what I had seen. I didn't really know what I saw, though I thought it was a Bigfoot. And uh, I went ahead and uh, started interviewing people who had had encounters with this so-called sexual monster Year prop years prior to that, and uh, I found I found a lot of other information that wasn't in the press as well. So that's kind of what got me started. That's that's awesome. That's pretty much what you know. In '94, I had a brief dogman encounter, very very brief. Um, and like like you, um, prior to the internet, you know, pre-internet. So it was very hard to find any information. Uh, you know, I was going to like used bookstores and, you know, finding some cryptozoological books and, you know, 
once the internet came up, it was a lot easier to find information and share information. Um, it must have been hard to, you know, find people to interview for, for, you know, your research back then. Um, how did you go? Well, about I was looking, yeah, I was lucky enough to know, uh, some people in town. Uh, I had worked with one of the individuals and, uh, a lot of the people that had those encounters were, uh, either family members or close associates, I guess, or friends. And, uh. You know, it, it made it pretty easy for me to get this information. And, uh, no, I mean, that's, you know, and that's kind of where it started off at. And of course, I had the, uh, I had this wing humanoid encounter back in 88 up here in Pennsylvania. And, uh, which was, which is interesting because, you know, that being over, oh my God, <laughs> all those years ago. Uh, over 30 years ago, I, what I did see, and I was with two other people, what we saw was very similar to what's being seen in around Chicago now. Yeah. So, and that's not the only sighting that, that occurred in that area. There had been five other sightings at least that had been reported to me, uh, since that time. In Pennsylvania? In that one part of Pennsylvania along yep. the Conewago <laughs> Creek, which is, and, uh, Adams in York County, Pennsylvania. Okay. Now, how long was that that encounter that you got? Was it a brief one or? Oh, very brief. We uh, we we had been called. Uh, my friend who I contact got in contact with uh, told me about it. He wanted to know if I'd go up with him and another friend to investigate Camp Conewago, which is a Boy Scout camp, which is still in use. Uh, there had been a lot of screaming sounds coming out of the woods and scaring the Boy Scouts, and they were packing up and leaving early. So they wanted to go in there and do an investigation, find out what it actually was. And they asked me, you know, they knew I was into paranormal, so they went ahead and asked me to come along with them. And uh, we eventually, you know, we spent, we got there on a Friday, spent all day Saturday traipsing along in the woods and, for several hours looking for evidence. Didn't get much uh, until that night. Uh, about 11 o'clock, we heard a, uh, a loud screaming sound. Uh, didn't know what it was. So we decided to stay up that night. And uh, about an hour and a half later, uh, I, you know, we were still sitting around the campfire. I got up to stretch my legs, and I had just had this feeling that and I did have this feeling a couple times that weekend, like something was watching. So I asked the guys, well, look, let's grab a flashlight to go up the trail a little bit. We were right along the river, excuse me, along the creek. And uh, the trail runs parallel to the creek. And we walked about, you know, we didn't walk more than 50 foot on to, to, the, to the trail from our campsite. And we all saw this, these red eyes standing up in the middle of the creek. Now, the creek was fairly shallow this time of year. It was in the fall. And uh, these red eyes were just bright. I mean, very bright. But by the time we got our flashlights on this thing, it literally jettisoned itself up into the air. We could hear a whooshing sound, but we never saw any wings on or anything like that. And when it reached its apex, it let out a loud screaming sound. It sounded like a child was screaming and kind of faded away as it kept screaming and flying away from us. So, uh, yeah, that was the first, that was the encounter with this winged being, even though we thought it had wings because we did notice some structures on its back, which we thought were probably unfurled wings, but it didn't utilize those to, to uh, ascend into the air which kind of had us surprised. And that's very similar to what we're getting in Chicago now. Yeah. So uh, these, these beings seem to have some type of propulsion other than using their wings. Now, going over to <clears throat> the Chicago area, do you have any mm -hmm. theories of why or what might be going on? Is it, it's just the airport, but is there a military base around Chicago O'Hare Airport? Or? No, there's no. There's no military base. The only facility that might have some involvement is the Fermi Labs, which is out in Cook County, 
they do have a cortical accelerator there. It's the oldest cortical accelerator in the world. It's been there for over 40 years. It's supposed to be shut down now. But, uh, we'll, you know, we've had people watching the area for years, and I just don't think that's the case. I think this place is, is still being utilized in some way. Uh, I mean, that's going on there. And But other than that, you know, you know, Harry International has a lot of weird things going on over the years, a lot of strange encounters, uh, paranormal spirits, UFOs, and possible alien involvement. Uh, I don't know how it's connected to this, quite frankly. But, uh, you know, the fact that we have this theory that it may be some type of interdimensional being uh, has to do with several of our witnesses have literally seen this thing disappear in flight. So um, it's like it went through, a, you know, an invisible doorway. All right. Yeah, um, the inter- interdimensional excuse me, beings, is that's one that I have always, I, I, I've had a lot of theories about cryptids and that um, for the longest time, I kind of put Sasquatch, Dogman into that realm because okay. one minute they're by a tree or behind a tree, the next minute they're not there. Um I, I, you know, it's it's real hard to to classify any of these creatures as that, but it's that's a great a great theory on what's going on with them. Um, I know Skinwalker Ranch is one of the the greatest places that could have interdimensional traveling. Um, right there because i mean you've got ufo activity you've got paranormal activity um in the old buildings out there people have claimed to see ghosts and stuff well as you know i mean it's just do you i think to for myself i think all of these fields or whatnot sasquatch uh ufos all of these have some sort of connection to each other um, how do you feel about that idea on my part? No, I, I, I do believe it. I think there is a connection. There have been, uh, sightings of UFOs and Bigfoot together. There have been sightings of other cryptids and orb activity or paranormal activity beyond that. Uh, yeah, I, I do believe most cryptids do have a, have a supernatural ability to move in and out of realities or possibly cloak themselves some count that there very well may be some indigenous beings, uh, like in the uh, Pacific Northwest, Florida, eastern Texas, areas um, around the uh, Gulf Coast. But all, in general, I think many of these sightings, uh, because they're usually singular individuals, may possibly be some type of uh, supernatural being right. uh, that has the ability to move in and out between realities or something yeah, I, I I agree. I agree with that, the indigenous species, especially where you just said, Oregon, Washington, you know, Florida. I, the, the Native Americans have always said, you know, that they had almost kind of made packs with these woodsmen or old men of the forest. Um, and especially in Washington, you know, um, it's it's just it's it's an amazing amazing field to study but once you get going you just you you go down this rabbit hole that just you know it brings you everywhere you want <laughs> you never have an answer you know uh how do you feel about that sometimes do you get overwhelmed or uh not overwhelmed but kind of uh lack of a better word frazzled that you just it's not all in black and white. Oh, it's never in black and white. I mean, you know, after all these years, I'm still surprised by some of what we get. And, uh, yeah, it's an enigma overall. I mean, you know, you get, you get these settings of these unexplained encounters and, um, unexplained creatures. And, you know, that's what makes the whole thing worth it. 
yeah. trying to figure out what's going on and what it is. And, uh, you know, that's why most of us do what we do. It's not like we're getting rich off of this, but we just aren't. Uh, you know, we're, we're basically out there as enthusiasts, but, you know, and there's no experts in this field. You know, it's just, you know, people that have been involved with it for a long time have more insight as opposed to people that, you know, are just new getting into it. But there's just a lot, there's just a lot of it out there. And I think a lot of it's tied together. And I think there's a lot of supernatural uh, aspects to what people see. Now, you're talking about Native Americans. You know, every, every tribe that I have researched and even talked to uh, current tribe members, these are spiritual beings to them. They're not necessarily... Uh, flesh and blood beings. They could be flesh and blood, but they're not indigenous. They have, uh, they have a way of, uh, moving in and out of this reality and that they are supernatural beings. Yeah. The Native Americans. Well, I'm, my family, um, I have a lot of family members that live on the Hogansburg Reservation, the Akwesachi Reservation, um, on the New York and Canada border. <clears throat> and I've experienced a lot of, you know, going up there as a child and, you know, teenager, uh, I experienced a lot of spiritual things that, you know, not, not paranormal, but spiritual, just, you know, sweat lodge. I was in a sweat lodge and I was with my cousin, my uncle and another uh, friend of the family and mid sweat, we, I, saw like an old man you know sitting between my uncle and my cousin and you know i had been in a couple of sweats prior to that um we were using rocks from mount saint helen so it was a very sacred uh sweat and i don't know if that's one of the reasons why i had that odd spiritual uh vision or whatever it was but it was it was definitely an interesting interesting little Thing that happened to me um i'm fascinated by you know all of the native american lore skinwalker wendigo i mean being mohawk is wendigo is pretty much the lore that i heard growing up uh, you know from my grandmother and stuff like that um let's move out west a little bit the uh i know that you have some involvement or friends that were involved with the Crypto Four Corners, um, rest in peace, uh, JC. But um, they've done a lot of work, and I think JC's son is running the group still. Uh, Jack Carey is actually doing most of the uh, the leg work for the, the group at this time, and he's part of my uh, Trans Monsters Fourteen Research Team. Yeah. Uh, he was basically uh, a protege of JC's. And he's been involved with a lot of the investigations uh, that JC has been involved with. And, um, yeah, uh, you know, I, you know, that the, the Four Quarters area is, it's a sacred area, basically. I mean, when you have the Navajo reservation on, you know, on both sides, Arizona and, and New Mexico, there's a lot going on there. And the only way you're going to get any insight of what goes on there is being associated with either the locals or people that live there and do the actual investigations. And, uh, you know, I have heard all kinds of stories coming out of that area for years. And I actually documented, uh, most of JC's investigations uh, post-2011. So uh, I had a pretty good idea of what he was involved with. Uh, he and other researchers that you know, worked with him. So, uh, yeah, the, the Four Corners is a great area. You know, I definitely want to get out there at some point and be, be able to spend some extended time at, out there doing research. Uh, that That is kind of a goal for me some point yeah that would be an amazing an amazing time i, I mean you've been like you said you you 
have a lot of, you know, with Phantom and Monsters, you, you have, you, uh, not researched, but written a lot of the, blogged a lot of the uh, encounters and what has been seen. And, you know, so you've got some inside info on that one. I, I'm sure that you're definitely looking forward to going out there. Um, and there's so many sacred areas. It seems like there's a lot more sacred areas out west for some reason. I mean, yeah, we have a lot on the east coast. Like, um, you know, New York has their share. Maine has their share. The Bridgewater Triangle. Uh, it's just, you know, I'm, I, I'd love to go out west just to, to do some feet on the ground research. And like you said, a lot of it is from the locals. And you just got to reach out and connect with them. Um, a lot of the <clears throat> stories that you have or encounters that you have on Phantom and Monsters, um, do people reach out to you or how do you get those encounters? Oh, I, I'm on the phone all the time uh, talking to people. It's, it's you know, and that's been going on for a long time now. I've been lucky enough to have people uh, be confident enough to come forward and talk to me and relay their information to me. And, uh, uh, you know, I've been very lucky in that respect. And that's why I, I kind of put this, this Phantoms and Monster Group Team research team together so we could actually have boots on the ground uh, to act and to go to these locations and and to meet up with clients and actually do the investigations on on I've always wanted to be able to follow up on some of the reports that are given to me personally. Now we have a, a better chance of doing that. You know, we're always looking for people to get involved with the group, uh, either as team members or affiliates, and. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of worked out pretty good so far. We're uh, we've got quite a good group and people that that do understand what we're trying to achieve. And uh, you know, that's how you get a lot of this information. And uh, we like to put it forth so people can look it over and kind of be educated as to what's really going on. Yeah, it's a, and it is a, a wonderful site to visit i i am fascinated by the amount of encounters or experiences in the broad it's not just one um field it's you know like shadow people sasquatch dog man ufo um it, it is truly an amazing website that you put together uh, i'm gonna put that link um in the description below for those of my people who don't have not been over there um is there a way that if anybody has an encounter they can share that with you is there a way that people can send that out to you is that on that web page as well yeah it's on, it's on the website but you can go to uh you can send me a direct email to long strickler at phantoms and monsters dot com or you can call me at uh four one zero two four one five nine seven four we have the, uh, the phantomsandmonsters.com site, plus the group has a new site, cryptidhunters.org. And uh, I'm also involved with Beyond Explanation on YouTube, which is a channel where we're actually making videos uh, and documentaries out of the cases I've worked on. That's awesome. Now, if people are interested in your books, Amazon.com? Yeah, that's the best place to find them. Uh, put my name, Lon Stripper, into the search at Amazon, and my books will come up. Now, I've, I've got three books that are available on either uh, uh, Kindle or paperback at the moment. Uh, the other ones I've basically discontinued, but my most recent book is uh, Wing Cryptids, uh, humanoids, monsters, and anomalous uh, creatures casebook. And uh, I, I pretty well go through all types of different um, 
uh, winged beings, sightings, and encounters that have been given to me and that I have actually looked into or my team has looked into, and it's documented in that case book. Okay. Now, when you say team, how what how many members do you have in your research team, roughly? Right now, we have 21 members on our team, the Phantoms and Monsters 14 team. Uh, and we also have affiliate groups throughout the world who actually will, will send to, uh, te- uh, cases too that we can't get, you know, get to their people uh, on the team just can't physically get to. So I'll I'll send it out to them and, and let them work on it and then report back to me. We've got about ten other affiliate members at this moment. Well, that's that is amazing. <laughs> that is really crazy. Yeah, if you go if you go to cryptidhunters dot org. Everybody on the team is listed there. All right. Um, pretty much the last question I have for you. Um, where do you see the field in the near future and the future beyond the near future? Well, I, it has a lot to do, to do with who wants to get involved with it and how serious people are with it as well. Uh, of course, the internet's been a lot easier to uh, peruse all types of uh, reports and information, and and even older stories that you know have been out there, but just had people just didn't have access to. But uh, you know, if it continues like that, people begin uh, remain serious about this, uh, and we get some younger blood involved with it. I, I think it looks pretty good. Uh, of course, a lot of this being shown on TV, though I don't particularly buy into all the uh, the television paranormal and cryptozoology shows, but uh, and, and I have been involved with them myself. I mean, I'll admit that. But I, I you know, it does keep people's interest up by watching those things. So um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that's kind of spurs things on. Uh, people are much more. Um, uh, I don't know, less apprehensive about coming forward with sightings. Uh, just like what's been going on here around Chicago, it, you know, the response to that has been overwhelming. But I know there are a lot of people that just have not made reports. So, uh, you know, that's something we continue to work on. And hopefully <clears throat> others will be inspired by what we do. And I think... Uh, I think the whole genre of the paranormal is very strong. Yeah, and it's the the people <laughs> nowadays. Um, it seems like there's a lot more open-minded people um, that are willing to accept and not not just call BS on people when they're sharing their encounters. And I think that's helped out a lot. Um, I, I just wish that the 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 government would kind of let let up a little bit on some of the things and <laughs> just maybe possibly do a uh, slow release of information. But you can never uh, you usually don't get too much that you wish for. So yeah, well, you know, as far as the government disclosure, that's gonna be that's gonna be spooked if it does. From, from now and into the future. I mean, there's not going to be, there's not going to be any great revelations by the government or military about any, uh, any UFO, you know, and even crypto, you know, uh, evidence or sightings and such. Uh, that's kind of left up to us to do that. Yep. Well, Lon, it was an honor having you on the show tonight. I really appreciate it. I can't thank you enough. Um, Is there any uh, departing words that you'd like to give everybody before we go? Well, uh, the only thing I can say is uh, if if you see something you don't understand or that you feel needs to be reported, don't hesitate to do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Lon, thanks once again. I truly appreciate it. And, uh, 
stay well and keep researching. Okay, Jeff, thanks. Well, there you have it, folks. A interview in the evening with Lon Strickler. Um, really nice guy. Really great interview. I'm really glad that I can call him a friend. Uh, and I'm glad or honored that James Darkwaters introduced me to Lon. So with that being said, thank you for supporting the channel. Your support is what keeps this channel growing and going and honestly what gives people a chance and a place to share their experiences and theories judgment free. Just treated with the respect we all deserve. Thank you. Please stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant, keeping an eye on our children, pets, family, friends. These creatures are real. They're out there and dangerous. Share this information with those you love and care about, and it may just help save their lives someday. Until next time, never stop asking questions, never stop searching for the answers, and God bless.